you're welcome. You're the guest of honor in our home, the home of our lives. Our Mondays, our Tuesdays, our Wednesdays, our Thursdays, our Fridays, our Saturdays, and not just our Sundays. God, be our 24-7 God. Be our 24-7 God. loving us so much that you willingly come in no matter the condition of our home and your life right now might be in shambles it might be cluttered it might be disorganized it might be dirty it might be run down but Jesus loves your house and he's a great remodeler We have to trust him in this process, though, church. Man, I just really sense God just wants to just talk with us individually right now about the state of our, our homes, our lives. And maybe just ask Jesus this question. what would you like to do in my home today? Maybe he doesn't want to touch anything. He just wants to sit down and be with you. Maybe he's not worried about the decor and worried about all the other stuff. Maybe he just wants to draw near to you. Jesus, we just give you permission. That's what we want. We don't want to build a life, Jesus, that we get to the end of our lives and it was all for nothing. But would you build our house? Would you build our houses, Jesus? give you the keys and we don't want you just to come in and be our remodeler be our friend, our father our lord our savior, our king our soon coming king you're everything to us we sum it up with Abba father Church, we're going to pray this morning, continue to pray. We were just singing prayers of what we've been doing. If you have a bulletin, go and pull it out, and you'll see an insert in there. And if you don't have one, we've got a slide for you, even with a QR code, and you can just take a picture of that QR code. It will take you to the people group. And it's the Embara Baldo group people group in Colombia. We're going we're gonna to join together and pray for them this morning. And I'm going to remind you of a people called the Moravians. And these were intense followers of Jesus. And there's a popular story that's, that's made its way through history of an island that had two to 3,000 slaves. And two of the young Moravians wanted to reach them for Jesus. But the slave owner had these slaves on an island. And he said, there are, there's no gospel witness welcome on this island. We don't want any clergy. We don't want any missionaries on this island. So these two young Moravians sold themselves into slavery so that they could share the gospel with these two to 3,000 slaves. This wasn't a a one-year sentence. This was a life sentence. 
of them selling themselves into slavery, they would never return. They were in their 20s. And they, they boarded a ship uh, with the other, other slaves. And, you know, you can imagine some of the moms and, and, and family members asking the question, is it, is it necessary? Is it, is it worth it to give your entire life away for these slaves? As they were leaving in the ship, they locked their arms together And they said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his sufferings. I believe as we pray this morning, you might think, man, I don't know these people. I don't know this people group. I may never go there. But may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his sufferings in this people group in Colombia. Let's pray for them with the same passion that the Moravians sold themselves into slavery to share the gospel with a people group that had never heard. And they deemed Jesus worthy to give their entire lives away to share the gospel with unreached people. It wasn't about how worthy these people are. It wasn't about the value of their own life. It was about the reward Jesus deserved for his sufferings. Would you stand to your feet and get in groups of three or four or five? And and if this is new to you and you might say, man, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. Good, because... This is, we're gonna, we're gonna utilize some muscles maybe you're not used to using and, and it's okay. And maybe in your group, you just wanna listen, but a, a good place to start and to stay is to pray the scriptures. And at the bottom of this, this uh, insert, you'll see the scripture, O Lord, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And you could pray something like this. Jesus, we pray that our lost brothers and sisters in Colombia would trust in you today. That they would walk in, in the blessing of knowing their creator today. In Jesus' name. You could pray something along those lines, praying the scripture, praying God's heart. These are his lost sons and daughters. These are our lost brothers and sisters. So please stand to your feet, get in groups of three or four, four or five. Make sure no one's left out. And if you don't feel comfortable praying, just just get in a group and listen. But please don't check out right now. Plug in, press in. Let's, Let's believe that God wants to move in this people group this morning, that he would receive the reward of his sufferings. Columbia this morning. God, an outpouring of your spirit in Columbia, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you'd receive the, re- the reward of your sufferings, Lord.
us, church. God's hearing your prayers. It's his heart to move. We're in agreement with what he already wants to do. I believe God is excited as we're praying for people that he loves. Sixty more seconds. Press in. Believe, God, for a revival in Colombia. God, that you would receive the praises due your name in Colombia. Every tribe, tongue, every nation on the earth would worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thirty more seconds, church. Jesus, we thank you that it's your heart to move in Colombia. When you were on the cross, you were thinking of this people group, these sons and daughters. You cry out to their hearts in their language this morning so that they can understand how much you love them. And we thank you for an outpouring of your spirit in Colombia. We thank you for a move of your spirit on the earth, that it would be on earth as it is in heaven in Colombia. You would strengthen the believers that are there, that the gospel would go forth, the gospel of the kingdom would go forth in demonstration of power. We thank you for miracles. We thank you for healing that would confirm the word. We thank you, God, that you will pour out your spirit as we see in the book of Acts in Colombia. We thank you that you would strengthen the leaders. And we thank you that you are moving, that this is your heart, God, to move. We're just partnering with what is already on your heart to do. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. you may back, wait, make your way back to your seats. We're going to go into a time of tithe and offering. If, you, if this is your first time here, um, you can get an envelope from the back of your chair and you can write on the envelope what ministry that you'd like to designate your offering to if you would like to designate it. And then you can come drop it in these baskets up here on the stage and just come up and drop them off anytime. So as I pray for the offering, as I bless the offering, I encourage you guys this morning to get alone with Jesus and just ask him, Jesus, what do you want me to give this morning? What do you want of me this morning? What part of me are you asking me to let go of this morning? Only the Lord can tell you <laughs> and only you can hear this from Jesus. Nobody else can tell you what you need to give. I can't tell you what you need to give or if you need to give this morning. Get alone with the Lord and let him speak to you and be obedient. That's all that we ask is for you to be obedient. When the Lord speaks, move. When the Lord tells you to go, go. When the Lord tells you to give, give. So let's have peace this morning knowing that as long as we are obedient and as long as that we are faithful, the Lord will bless us and the Lord will take care of us, okay? So let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much this morning for your spirit. God, thank you for moving in and through us. Lord, thank you that you're already doing a new thing. You're already moving in the hearts of us and we still have a whole morning to finish. Lord, I pray that every dollar that is given this morning, every cent that is given this morning, I pray that it would be blessed in the name of Jesus. I thank you that it will be used to greater your kingdom. It will be poured back into your house, this house, this church, this family. I pray peace in the hearts of everyone in this room this morning. The peace that passes all understanding when we don't know what's gonna happen next, we can have peace anyways. Peace in the fact that knowing that we're being obedient 
and that you love us and that you're gonna take care of us. We thank you for all these things. In your name I pray, amen. Hey guys, this song's a little bit, uh, you might not have heard it before. It's pretty simple, but it's called Every Nation. And we're just gonna sing this as a prayer to Jesus that he would come and pour out his spirit on all of those who've never heard his name before. All the nations, they will come, holding broken chains above their heads, singing we
You're worth us selling all to go across the street or go across the planet. You're worth it. God, let our lives be lived for eternity and not for the short term. God, that our lives would be an investment into eternity, that we would sow our lives into the soil of your heart. That God, you would bury us. That something greater would come from our life than just living for ourselves. Bury us, Jesus, in your heart. That we wouldn't live for lesser goals. But we would live to glorify your name. That whatever you ask of us, we would gladly say yes. If that means living in Galveston, yes. Living in Columbia, yes. Friends would, yes. Whatever our yes needs to be to you, Jesus. We want to give it without comparison to other people's yeses. Jesus, we say yes before you even ask us where to go. (laughs) Yes. It's a yes. And if that's your heart this morning, you could say like Joshua, as for me in my house, We say yes to Jesus. We don't get it perfect. We don't have everything figured out, but Jesus, you have our yes to follow you wherever you lead us. And when it gets difficult, and it's a difficult yes, we trust that your grace will be sufficient for every yes. In Jesus' name. You know, it's a, it's a good place to be to give Jesus a yes before you know where he's asking you to go. Because otherwise you just start to uh, measure and figure it out and, and weigh it out and count the cost and do the math and all that other stuff. And, and the yes isn't maybe as sweet. Okay, so let me take care of a little housekeeping here. Uh, I don't know if housekeeping is the best word about what I'm about to announce. I'm going to dismiss our uh, teenagers to the cafe. Uh, it's Youth Sunday. Uh, they're going to go with Miss Chris. And uh, yeah, you guys can clap for that. <clears throat> Today we are keeping our 7 to 12 year olds in with us. Um, but our teenagers, the last Sunday of the month, are going to go back there and catch fire for God. So. Thankful for teenagers. Okay, guys, um, we are sadly, this is going to be our last uh, message for our House of Prayer series. You can go, aw, but don't be sad because uh, we're not leaving this theme. I mean, God just has us on a track. We turned the corner into 2022 and uh, just began to sense God inviting us to be to be and to become a dwelling place for him. And not even really knowing exactly like, okay, we kind of maybe know what that means, but I don't know if we fully know what that means, but we want to be students of your presence. We want to follow your lead. We want to be one thing people. <clears throat> and uh, we started our service with Psalm 27, 4. It's been a theme verse for us. Uh, the one thing I crave from God, the one thing I seek above all else is to live with him every moment In his house, beholding his marvelous beauty, filled with awe, delighting in his glory and grace. And so we've used some of this other type of language is that we want to be a church that first and foremost is learning to attract God, not people. And and that that changes everything. Um, Yeah, I mean, you can clap for Jesus, right? Because it's, um, you know, we're we're learning what this looks like and and I've said to people that are that are new to this house uh, that I am I am not the leader of this church I'm the first follower 
Uh, Jesus is our leader. And, and I mean that, and we're learning, like, what's it look like to give space for Jesus' active, present leadership? And what it looks like when we gather like this, it looks like me sitting there uh, worshiping Jesus and asking Jesus, what do you want to do? What do you want to say? And holding our little plan loosely. Um, we believe that the same God who can, can change things spontaneous is also with us in our planning. So we think it's both and, but we hold those plans loosely in case God wants to do something unique and different, uh, even as we gather, and, and trying to live life that way as well, not just a, a gathering place of, of asking God to do that. And so, um, but we're learning. We're learning. Uh, and so that, what that means for leaders is that we're the first followers uh, of, of Jesus as, as we learn to follow his lead and um, making space for his present active leadership. And so in this, this House of Prayer series, we've been talking uh, a lot about different aspects, aspects of prayer, the tabernacle of David, this 24-7 praise and worship uh, where, where the ark was central. Um, and, and this went on for 33 years. David led this out. In, uh, in Amos 9-11, uh, James uh, quotes that prophecy, the brother, the brother of Jesus, in Acts, 13, Acts 15, and says that uh, this, this prophecy that says that the tabernacle of David will be rebuilt in the days of old, be restored. And not necessarily the tabernacle itself, but the spirit of it, of, of, a, of a people that centralize God's presence and, and make him central. And so we're learning what that means. And this is, Jesus said it this way. He said, the house I'm building will be a house of prayer. This is the house that I'm building. It will be a house of prayer. Matthew 21, 12, 13, it says, Jesus went into the temple. This is after he rode in on a donkey. And they, they sang Hosanna to him in the palm branches. After this, he, he goes into the temple and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. This was not uh, prim and proper Jesus. Uh, This was Jesus with zeal for his father's house. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So Jesus, this this is also a prophecy. He's also um, reciting a a prophetic word that, that his father's house would be a house of prayer. Now, when we think of prayer, I've, I've worked hard through this series to redefine that, that when most of us think of prayer, we think of list. I want you to think of person. I want you to think of presence, not list. Put your prayer list aside. You get to it later. It's a lot less important than the person you're talking to. So if Think of the person maybe on this earth that you respect the most, that you think has the most wisdom, that you really, you know, look up to on the earth. If you were to get to be with that person, I would suggest you ask questions and listen and do a lot less talking than, than, than listening. You would want to listen um, mostly because you respect that person. You know, they... they are in a place maybe where you want to be. And so when we get with God, sometimes we just think we have to talk, 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 talk. And it's better to listen and to look and to behold. And this was this prayer of David, this Psalm 27, 4. I want to I wanna dwell. I want to seek. I want to gaze. Those were terms that David was using when he thought of prayer. And so this house of prayer, don't think of this just machine gunning, you know, these prayer needs to God. Think of being with him. This house of presence is another way you could say it. And God's inviting us into this to cast down every other lesser pursuit. Now, let me just prepare you as we get into this message. It's going to be very practical. And God's calling us to something. So we've talked a lot of ethereal Ideas and maybe some things that are, you, you know, are easy to amen. And now it's time to let the rubber meet the road of what God's really calling us to. It looks like something. And I would say there's none more worthy in all the earth that we've found. And so the things he's calling us to are, uh, we want it to be a, a joyful yes that we give to him. 
So here are some things that we, we talked about through this series that God's inviting us to, to cast down every lesser pursuit and to pursue him. That God, when we do this, will rule and reign and manifest himself where he is honored. So God is, is everywhere all the time. That's not in question. But where God manifests himself, if you, want, if you want to confirm that that's a biblical concept, read John 14 and 15. And Jesus is talking to the disciples. He's about to leave the planet. And he's like, it's better. I'm sending Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit will manifest himself to you. He'll make himself known. He'll, he'll make his home, his abode in you and with you. And he says, too, I won't. I won't reveal myself to the entire world, but I will to you. The context of that entire conversation is that he's talking to friends. God manifests himself differently amongst friends than he does just general groups of people. He's knocking on the door, and for those that will open and let him in, he wants to have dinner with us. He wants to eat with us. He wants to have intimate relationship with us, friendship. And so we want to be a people that learns to attract his presence. What does he like? What doesn't he like? You know, if you, if you have a friend over and you know that they're allergic to peanut butter, you probably don't want to serve peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. All right. You want to learn what do they like? What do they enjoy? Because you're honoring them. And so wrap all that up to say that God will inhabit a people who prioritize his presence and put him at the center of everything we do. This does look like something that I'm going to call us to this morning. The, the idea of this is like, yes and amen. Man, we want to prioritize his presence. What's it look like to prioritize his presence? We're going to talk through that. Now, this next slide I want to show you was something that when we started this series, um, uh, it, was, it was one early morning, and, and I, I just felt like God was downloading three sentences uh, into my heart for us as a church. And um, so you've heard me say these before, but I, I felt like God wanted to remind me, to remind us, to to. Uh, just stir our hearts again to the things he was saying, that I'm inviting everyone into this pursuit of becoming a dwelling place. This is not a Robert thing that, you know, is going to come and go in as a phase, like a teenage phase or something like that. This is who we are becoming. God's inviting us, this house, us as a people. And, and it's, it's not about a person uh, in the church, but the church. He also said, I'm pruning my church so that she may bear greater fruit. Now, here's the thing about pruning is you cut away good things when you prune. Yeah, you don't prune an unhealthy plant. You actually prune healthy ones uh, so that they'll bear even more fruit. And so you're cutting away good stuff. And that, that sounds really like great in theory, until God wants to start pruning good stuff out of your life, right? And then we're like, hold on, wait a minute, I really like that. Have you ever gone to clean out your closet and you're like, yeah, I kind of like all these now that I'm thinking about really getting rid of them before. I, I haven't worn them in years. But when you go to like cut it off, all of a sudden it feels more valuable. Or that thing that's been sitting in your garage, this will happen to us. We're always buying and selling stuff. And, and uh, Susie will say, hey, go get that thing. I get someone coming by to get it. And I'm like, oh, man, kind of like that now that, you know, someone's buying it for $10. You know, it's probably, if you know Susie, it's worth five. And uh, so I'm like, okay, okay, but all right, you know. <laughs> and um, it's sometimes... Getting rid of good things is really difficult, but God's grace, he'll help us in this. And then lastly, you know, I'm disrupting business as usual. God is doing it. God is doing it. God is doing something different on the earth. I'll just say it very, very frankly, that I don't believe that the way that we've 
done church up to this point. I think it's been good. I think it had its run. I think those days are over. I think the days of, of just church being a Sunday morning thing that, is, you know, uh, is just more of a cultural um, concept. Uh, there's a reason why after COVID, churches have gotten smaller. God's pruning so that we can bear more fruit. Now, you might say, is God getting rid of people? I don't think God gets rid of people, but when pressure comes and when uh, heat comes, it will, there, there, will be, there will be those that, that don't press into him but shrink back. And this, this, is, this is prophesied. Now, I, I believe God's pruning us to greater fruit. I, I sincerely believe that, that we're going to be a part of and see uh, the greatest outpouring ever that we've ever, that we, certainly we've ever seen, but I believe that mankind has ever seen on the earth because I believe Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. And I believe before he does, he wants to pour out his spirit and he starts with the church and he begins pruning her so she can bear more fruit. Now all are, are welcome and invited into this journey uh, and into what God is doing um, but, but God is doing something different, something different, something new. Um, and, and it's going to take a new wineskin to hold this new wine that God wants to, wants to pour out. And so, you know, David, I'm kind of just pulling, plucking from our series here a little bit, uh, who this tabernacle of David, what he did was, was restored the Ark of the Covenant that was it represented the presence of God and brought it and made it central. But we know, if you know this, uh, in Chronicles, the, the first time he tried to bring the ark home, it didn't go so well. He put it on a, uh, on a cart, <clears throat> had oxen pulling it. Wrong, wrong. He did both of those things wrong. But he had, he had, a great, he had great intention. Well, if you know the story, you know the oxen stumbled. The, the ark starts to slide off the cart. Uzzah. That's the right thing, you would think, right? I'm going to catch the ark, but God doesn't need our help. Uh, and he goes to steady that thing and drops down dead. And David actually gets angry and angry with God and, and begins to wrestle with this question, how do I bring the ark home? I mean, these guys, you can imagine, were celebrating, were, we had the best of intention to make God's presence central. Just in my heart, this is not a declaration over the Capital C Church, but in my heart, my perception, and I've been walking with Jesus uh, since 1994, so I have some history and, and some track record to look, look over my shoulder and see. I think this is what we've been doing as church in, in America. We've had great intentions. We've had great ideas, but I think we thought we could do it our way. And, and we built a cart, and we had oxen, and we, we had all these great ideas and intentions, but it wasn't necessarily God's way. And what I think that way was, I think if you just want to boil it down, and this started a couple decades ago, is that we began to, to be seeker sensitive. It was a good intention. We, we want to win the lost. Of course we do. But we became less about prioritizing the presence of God and more about prioritizing how to win people to Jesus, which is a good thing. David was doing a good thing. And someone still died. Because God does have a way. And the way that God has is he must be central. And if he's not, it's not because he's got a big ego, it's because he's God. It's because he is number one. It's not because he wants to be number one. He is. It's who he is. So we have to put him in his rightful place, and then he does what he wants to do. If I am high and lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. And we thought, man, if church is high and lifted up, and if we, we, we shorten the worship and shorten the message and, and don't make people feel uncomfortable and, and, and dumb down our worship and our expression of love for him, and then no one will feel uncomfortable when they come in, then they'll come in and meet this Jesus that we love and adore and think is awesome. <laughs> think about the logic in this. Don't be so loud. 
Don't be so crazy. Put your banners away. Put your flags away. Put your shofar away. Put your, you know, all your dancers away. Put it all away. We want everyone to come into this house and feel comfy. Crank up the air condition. Shorten the service to 45 minutes. Preacher better not go over 30. We meant well. But it's not going to work anymore. It had its day. I think God, God had grace on the church. I'm, I'm the church. I'm part of this. I'm not knocking churches that still do that. I'm really not. But as for us, that's not going to work for what this generation needs. There's not enough gifting in the body of Christ to minister to the needs of the world. So if we, if we really do care about our city, our neighbors, the nation, we need a move of God. And it needs to start right here. I don't know exactly what that will look like as it unfolds. I, I don't really know, and I don't want to presume to know, but I know this, that, that we want him first. And so we've been wrestling with the same question. How do I bring the ark home? How do we build our lives around his presence? How do we become a dwelling place for God on the earth in Galveston? And this is the title of the message today, In Galveston as it is in heaven. In Galveston. Now, I'm not, not including you that don't live on the island, okay? But I do believe that God wants to start with a people, with a real people in a real place. Like, it's, it's not just this spiritual idea of on earth as in heaven. And we even began to wrestle with this as leaders, you know, about a year ago. And we said, you know, we want to reach Galveston. 50,000 people, okay? And then, and then really got some wisdom from some other leaders that said, hey, why don't you just start with a 10-block radius around your church? Oh, okay, we can, that's more realistic. It's not that we're not including those outside of that, but we're just saying we're, we're dedicated, we're committed to this 10-block radius to reach, the, to reach Galveston, and it's both and, and learning to, to live life that way. So how do we bring the ark home? How do we make his presence central? How do we reach the island? How do we host your presence? And the first invite that God has given us is to become a, a person of a per, with a personal prayer closet. This is, this is where we started this series. This is the first invitation. So if we're on like week seven, I think, and we've had eight weeks because there was, there was uh, Easter in there. And if in this series of the house of prayer, and this is not a, this is not a condemning thing. This is just, l- let me just bring this to, to reality. If there's been no change in your prayer life <laughs> in eight weeks of talking about prayer and his presence and consecrating yourself and prioritizing him and sitting before him and gazing at his face, if there's been no change, let today be the beginning. There ha- it has to be something that looks like something, not just an, an idea that's floating out there that I agree with, but something that changes Monday. Okay? He's inviting us to this. The days of being a church, of depending on the pastor to to hear from God and give the word are gone. (laughs) It's not going to work anymore. It's not enough for you. It's not enough for me. The days of relying on a staff of people to do the spiritual work of of making disciples and reaching the the city, those days are over. They're gone. God's spirit won't allow it to work anymore because he's doing something new. He's doing it. He's inviting us. This isn't a strategy we birthed up in a back room. Actually, God began to speak to the leaders separately. We came together and realized God was doing this of drawing our hearts back to him to make him central. It sounds like so simple. It's like kind of duh. But we had gotten so busy as a church. And again, I think this is a symptom of the bigger 
capital C of what, what's been happening, we've gotten so busy doing things for Jesus that prioritizing his presence had just taken a back seat. You want to find the smallest meeting in any congregation? Go to the prayer meeting. <clears throat> I'm not condemning anyone. I'm, just, I'm saying this is the state of where we're at. And so it's time for, to, to answer the, the invite. Okay? I'm going to show you the coolest invitation I've ever received. I've been carrying it around. It's kind of scratched up. Coggins, do you guys recognize this? It's kind of scratched up, okay? But I've kept it. I've kept it. And anyone else, if you have yours? Because I'm like, I'm not throwing this away. This is the coolest. This is a wedding invitation from the Coggins. They got married just a few weeks ago. Let's give them a hand. This is, this is plastic. This is really cool. And when I got this, I was like, my first thought was, this is really cool. And then I thought, why put so much in, into an invitation that, some, that people are going to probably throw away? And I, don't, I didn't ask them this. I, I, I have not talked to them. They didn't know I was going to use this, and they're probably going to, you know, want some, some uh, kickback now on the proceeds. <laughs> Uh, but as I, I really thought about this invitation a lot, and as I did, I felt like Jesus, is, is, because he was inviting us, and this, that's been the, the language on my heart as we turned into 2022, is that God is inviting us to something. And so I've been saying to you that the, the way to RSVP for God's invitation is to consecrate yourself. That's, that's what David told the Levites as he prepared them to carry the ark and to bring God's presence back central. He said, consecrate yourself unto the Lord before we do this. And it dawned on me that Jesus is the invitation. It's an invitation to him. He is the invitation. And so whatever we do with the invitation is what we do with Jesus. If we are SVP, then we're, we're saying, yes, Jesus, you're worthy. And if, and if we don't RSVP, which I'm sure people showed up that didn't RSVP, that's just the nature, human nature, because we want to leave our options open and something, in case something better comes along, I don't want to be committed to this one thing. And Jesus is saying, commit to me. The, the spirit of adultery, I think, is, is being exposed in our hearts. And adultery is not being committed to the thing you committed to. The sickness that has made its way through the body of Christ is saying, oh, I, I got the invite. I don't know if I'm going to be there or not. I think it's valuable. I, I think it's really cool. I like it. But I'm not, I'm not necessarily all in in case something better comes along. And there's been a division in our hearts that maybe we're not even aware of, that's an ache in our soul. And I, I think it's because we're, we've just maybe haven't seen Jesus for who he truly is. Maybe he's been the cultural Jesus. Maybe he's been the you had a good season two years ago Jesus. Maybe he's the, he was great during the honeymoon Jesus. But the the now Jesus for you is maybe kind of old and lame and boring. And he wants us to see him again fresh with new eyes. That the spirit and the bride would say, come. That's the heart of a heart that's been awakened to its first love. Come, Jesus, come now. 
Not just come and rescue me out of this dark, nasty world. Come into my heart, into my life afresh right now. I need to see you for who you are. So David, as he wrestles with this, how do I bring the ark home? He tells the, the, the Levites to consecrate themselves, to set their lives apart. Jesus is the invitation. Look at 1 Chronicles 15. He said to them, you're the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourself, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. If we're going to be a people that learn how to host his presence. Now, when I say consecrate yourself, I'm not saying get, get your act together. I'm just, I believe it's what God is saying is RSVP. Just go all in. When we got this, of course, I was officiating the wedding, so I, I was committed to it. But we've all gotten those invitations to good things, people that we love, people that we like. But we don't RSVP and, and for different reasons. I don't know why we all don't RSVP, but we don't. And, and I think that if we're really going to see God do what God wants to do, it's not going to be from one, two, three, or four people. It may start there, and it has started there. Topher is sowing hours every week into prayer and worship at the, at the house of prayer. Just, I'm, I'm with him on, on, on Wednesdays, and we're, we're just starting there before, as we're getting our prayer room ready here. It has to start somewhere, but I think if we're going to see God do, if we really want heaven on earth in Galveston as it is in heaven, it's going to come from a people that RSVP, that commit and consecrate themselves unto the Lord. That David said, that's, that's what you have to do to prepare yourself to bring the ark central, to make his presence central. And so it does look like something. It does look like a commitment. It does look like time. It does look like us adjusting ourselves to what God wants to do. And, and it may be slower than we're used to. We worship busy. <laughs> busy, I mean, the God of busy makes us feel important. The God of busy makes us feel like we're getting stuff done. The God of busy makes us feel like we, we've accomplished something. The God of busy uh, keeps us, you know, spinning and buzzing and thriving on, on other things. And I believe what God is, is doing now is going to be slow. I, I, I wish it weren't, but I believe it's going to be. First Chronicles 15 says, because God, this is as they brought the, the ark uh, central, or when they did, because God helped the Levites who were carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. Now in 1 Samuel, it says that they did this every seven steps. Oh, my gosh. Every seven steps up this long pathway to the tabernacle. That is slow. But God was doing something new and making his presence central. You don't just put it on a cart and get the ox together and I... All right, boys, yeah, yeah, and let them run up, the, run up the road. That's not how it works. Seven bulls, not doves, bulls, rams, every seven steps. Even if you make those big Drew Power steps, it's still a lot of sacrifice. It's slow. As, as we build out the prayer room, there's going to be days and weeks that feel slow. As you cultivate a prayer life before God, there's times you sit before him and you sense his presence, and there's times you don't. There's times that just feel like, I'm here. I trust that you're here, and I'm just going to be here. 
with my Bible open before you and trusting that you're doing something. I mean, but think about all the things that God does. Think about a garden. Think about creation. Think about, uh, you know, childbirth. Think all those things. They're, They're slow. You talk to a mama who's in nine months and she's like, come on. This is great, but this has been great long enough. Let's get this baby out. I mean, God could have made that happen in nine weeks, you know. But he likes to do things slow. And in, in, in our American culture where we like it fast, we, we like it quick, we like it now. And, and I'm saying it to myself. I, I do too. And, and I just believe, though, what God's going to do is, is going to wind down the inner engine in us so we can walk with him and breathe again. <laughs> They brought the ark, 1 Chronicles 16, they brought, the, brought in the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David pitched for it. They offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. This is a picture of many things, but I think it's even a picture of our fellowship being around the presence of God. I think the days of high personality speakers and and all, all the stuff that we used to draw people in, I'm done. Uh, you may not be done. I'm done. <laughs> Come to this conference because this guy's there and this girl's there and this person's there. And hey, there, there's an anointing on people's lives. It's great. But I think what, what God's doing now is like we're going to say on May 15th, when our first meeting in our prayer room, as it's done, it's called Jesus Night. Who's going to speak? <laughs> Jesus. Who's the big deal? Jesus. No, but I mean, really, who's going to speak? Jesus. (laughs) We might have a little mini teaching, but it's not like, hey, man, we're bringing in the big hitters. Whoever you think that, Stephen Furtick, man, he's coming. You know, or whoever you like. Stephen Furtick's not my favorite, so (laughs) whoever you like. Francis Chan's coming. We're like, oh, it'll be packed. Those days are over, and as far as I'm concerned, that, that what has to become central is his presence. And not that we don't get something from people's giftings, and it's, it's not that that doesn't have its place. It's just had way too high of a place over the last decade. And I think Francis Chan would agree with that. <laughs> Francis Chan's been calling us to, like, get on our face before Jesus he walked away from a mega church. Oh, the pastors of the world are like, you're crazy. You walked away from the dream come true. He said, I walked away from the American dream come true. I want heaven's dream come true. And it's gun- they're colliding. The two are colliding. Heaven's dream and America's dream are colliding. Okay, let me finish here. You guys are really slowing me down. Okay, Jesus is inviting, yeah, that's right, that's right. Jesus is inviting us to this, so I want to ask you to RSVP to Jesus. The second part of the invite, and there is no third, just so you know, if you're, there's just two parts, uh, is for us to be a house, a, a dwelling place for him, a house of prayer, corporately, a house of prayer. This is the invitation. Uh, Look at Matthew 13. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. I think that this is what it looks like to prioritize the presence of God. That we say there's a lot of other good and valuable things, but this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. Psalm 132 
This is David's vow before God. I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. We talked about in, in weeks past that, that it's this image of us digging a well. And when you're digging a well, it's nothing but dirt and rocks and, and until you hit pay dirt, and you hit water, then we said if if we will prioritize God's presence, everything else that maybe is a concern to us or of value to us will be taken care of. Now, we're not digging the well so Jesus can bless us. We're digging the well because he's the blessing. He's the invitation. He's the reward. He's the dream come true. He's what our hearts are after. It's Jesus And we're we're digging into his heart, and we believe that that will spill over into everything else that we do. Okay, now let me just wrap this up in a practical sense, talking about the prayer room. If you haven't heard us talk about the prayer room and, and you're new to this, we're taking half of our cafe and making it a prayer room that will be accessible 24 7. And really, what what we're envisioning is that there would this would be an open invitation for for all of us to give ourselves to to different uh, prayer hours, prayer slots during the the week, 24-7, okay? Um, There would be a code to get into this this space. Um, The roll-down garage doors are going to be installed this week. The mini split AC unit is going to be installed this week. Uh, one of our garage doors got dented in delivery, so there may be only be one up there before May 15th. We'll see. Um, we're at about 11,000 of the 15,000 that we're, we're raising toward that, so thank you, Jesus, for what he's doing. We also, in that space, will have Jesus Nights, May 15th. I want to encourage you to mark your calendar. It's a Sunday night. We're going to meet here at 5 o'clock and, and just get around the presence of God. Uh, just learn to host him. Learn what he likes. Learn how to respond to what he's doing in the moment. And, and I believe that out of this prayer space, culture is going to be developed as we become a people of his dwelling. And, of course, we are already doing nation's prayer once a month. If you have any questions about that, you can see uh, Lindsay Morrow's here this morning and, and leads that out with uh, Austin and um, that is, is also going to be, and it has been, in what, what will be the prayer room. So our response, I, I think, is just simply setting ourselves aside to God. And what that looks like, first and foremost, is cultivating a personal prayer life. There's lots of tools. There's lots of things you can, you can tap into um, that are online and, and different apps. The, the Lectio 365 is a great prayer app, but cultivating prayer. If you want to learn how to pray, pray. You can read books, you can, do, you can listen to messages, and those are great supplements, but learning how to pray is just getting alone with God with your Bible in your hand and a notebook and just begin to pray. You can pray the scriptures. I want to encourage you to to have a, a goal. I don't think this is, this is far-fetched, but that you spend an hour a day with Jesus, even if it's 20 minutes here, 10 minutes there, or 30 minutes, whatever. I don't want to put a burden on your shoulders, but also if, if we're really, really going to build our lives around his presence, it does look like something. And It doesn't have to look the same for everyone, but there there is an invitation with your name on it. And I think if we could see how excited God is to send it to us, what he has in store for us, that he draws pleasure from us, he loves being with us, he loves hearing your voice, he loves spending time with you, that the burden that's on prayer will, will fall off. Again, Most of us think prayer of what I say, what I do, my list, my needs. Those things have their place, but they are secondary to knowing him, gazing upon his beauty, loving him, worshiping him, blessing him, 
finding out what's on his heart, and then prayer becomes an agreement in praying with God instead of just praying to God. And it is a, it is a different approach. I believe God wants to give us eyes to see. Revelation 4, 6. And before the throne, there, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. I don't really know what to do with that. But I do know that they see God afresh. And, and they see some, something different about him. And they sing, holy, holy, holy. There's none like you. You're amazing. You're majestic. You're lovely. You're beautiful. Holy, holy, holy. And, and they're seeing him. The, the, this is for all of us. The lack of response of worship to God from our lives is not because you don't know how to sing. It's because we're not seeing him. When you see him and you see him more clearly every day and you behold him and you set time aside to be with him and you begin to gaze upon him, worship is a response to what you're seeing, to who you're seeing, to who's being revealed to you. So, when I was a youth pastor and we'd come into gatherings and be like, come on guys, raise your hands, lift your voice. Because they'd just be like. It would drive me crazy. <laughs> but all my screaming and shouting and kicking and running around, kicking over, I didn't kick anything over, but you know, just like all of my earthly zeal wasn't enough even for me or them. There's a zeal you, you and I can tap into that is never gonna run dry. It's the same zeal that Jesus went in and turned over the tables because when the disciples saw it in John, the second chapter, and they see Jesus, and this is in all the gospels, twice in John, and Jesus goes in and flips over the tables, they say zeal for his father's house consumes him. That's what they, they, when they saw Jesus do that, this man's zeal for his father's house has consumed him. And I believe God wants his zeal to consume us for his house. His zeal that'll never run dry. And as we see him, it, our, our lives will be a response of worship. Would you stand to your feet with me? Church, a new day is here. He's inviting us into it. He's doing a new thing. I rewrote Psalm 132, verse 13 and 14 for you. I believe this is legal. It says, the Lord has chosen Galveston, Zion. He's desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell for I have desired it. I believe it's God's desire because you're here. He loves you. He moved in. You're the temple. You and I are the, the, the tabernacle of his presence. And I believe he actually wants a real people with real faces, with real relationships in a real place to come together to, to, to glorify him, to make him central, to make his presence the priority of all that we do. And then he will do what he wants to do among us in Galveston as it is in heaven. Yes, Lord. So we thank you, Jesus, that you are inviting us. You are the invitation. Oh, and this invitation carries more value than any invitation we've ever received. You are the invitation, Jesus. And so we thank you, and we want to say to you, yes, we commit, we set our lives aside for you, for your presence, for your purposes. God, you're worthy. We found none more worthy in all the earth. And we want to be where you are, be a part of what you're doing. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask some of our prayer team to come forward. If you need prayer for any reason, please come forward. And if not, let's just bless him. Let's just worship him and, and give him the praise he's 
he's worthy of.
have just a few announcements before we go. Uh, my first announcement is to our guests. This is your very first time here. Big, big welcome to you guys. I'm so happy that you're here with us this morning. If no one has told you hi yet, uh, let me be the first. No one has told you they're excited that you're here, let me be the first, because we are so happy that you chose this church. Yes, we can give our... We can clap for them. We're so happy that you chose this to be your home church this morning. Uh, we have a free gift for you guys. If you'd like to go to our connect table, it's in the back left, my, my left, your right. Um, we have some awesome leaders back there who want to get to know you, want to talk to you, maybe even give you a hug if that's cool. Uh, my second announcement is uh, May 15th, as Robert said, we have our first Jesus night in our prayer room. Guys, this is a huge night. This is huge. We've been waiting, waiting so long and praying for this night, and it's finally here. Jesus night uh, in the cafe, in the prayer room, well, cafe slash prayer room, May 15th. Um, next week, guys, we have a really special thing next week. We have Kurt Mailer with us. You don't know who that is. Oh my gosh, you don't want to miss it. You want to be here and hear Kurt speak. He's going to be with us. He's amazing. That's all I can really say. Um, you don't want to miss that. And then May 8th is Mother's Day. We have Susie preaching that morning. You don't want to miss that either. We have some really great services coming up that you don't want to miss. So mark it on your calendars. Be here Sunday morning. <laughs> uh, and that's all I have for you guys. Have a blessed Sunday. We love you so much, and we'll see you next week. Bye, guys.